This is an attempt to revisit the relevance of Gandhiji's principles in farming and how the community can play a significant role in supporting the farmers. In most of the civilizations, agriculture remained the dominant occupation. It was primarily community-based activity wherein the farmers used to save the seeds, share them with each other, help them in transplanting, harvesting, in exchange of services. However, this changed over a period of time, especially through the industrialization and became cash-centric society. Over the last century, modern industrialized agriculture has been dominating the world with few exceptions, leading us to the current agrarian crisis with its intensive industrial farming practices and indiscriminate use of chemicals. Trappings of industrial agriculture includes monocrop culture, yield-centric, market dependability, soil degradation, mechanization, loss of connection to earth, and life itself. More and more data clearly shows that the adverse impact of industrial agriculture and our current lifestyle on biodiversity, health, our food systems, climate change, and it also resulted in disharmony with each other and nature. We will hear about these experiences from some of the community members. So in the Midwest in Illinois, where I grew up, it's, I grew up in a sea of corn and soybeans. And I, it was just what was around me. I just accepted it growing up. And then I have come to learn at some of the most tragically devastating agricultural practices on the planet. It's all GMO seeds um, and lots and lots of chemicals, uh, herbicides, pesticides, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, fertilizer, everything. It's all just chemicals that comes out of big tanks and it's, uh, uh, and they're constantly tilling the fields up and you can see in places where there's this beautiful topsoil that they say took 10,000 years for the short grass prairie to develop after the last ice age. And it's just, and that 10,000 years it's built up this, you know, many feet of this rich black topsoil. And then it's just getting, just eroding away before your eyes practically every year. You can see how the fields are just washing away and blowing away. And it's, it's like the epitome of unsustainable agriculture. And it's, it's heartbreaking to think back about that and to know what's going on there. The realization that how we were growing food in Fresno and in the Central Valley, the breadbasket of California, the breadbasket of the continent, uh, was not was so much out of harmony with life that it started really hurting us to see that here we could live at 8,000 feet and drink water from a creek. And when we needed to get food, we drove down to the valley and found a vast man-made desert. And we would watch the tillers driving the fields and watch the topsoil fly away that we could be 50 miles from the base of the Sierras and not even be able to see the mountains. It was a pretty shocking reality for us at the time. And while growing up with, uh, from both my parents and my grandfather, I was very inspired by uh, Gandhian principles, primarily centered um, around natural living on the one hand, and um, also uh, his principle of um, uh, bringing industry back into the villages from the away from the urban centers so that every little village unit would be uh, self-sustainable. And from there, I came to the United States where I uh, got absorbed into the larger industrialized uh, capitalist system where the name of the game was uh, consolidation and bringing together an industrialization of even ancient human activities such as uh, agriculture.
as an engineer, uh, I, uh, my field is computer science, and in fact, my subfield within computer science is, uh, is what's known as artificial intelligence. Part of uh, what I've worked in, the field I've worked in for about 25 years, is to study models uh, and uh, algorithms that try to mimic what the brain does. So, in a way, we take intelligence that's a natural commodity of every human being and we try and uh, manufacture it in an artificial way. And the one thing that has characterized the field of artificial intelligence is that it has been spectacularly unsuccessful. Uh, that it, the, the more we look at it, the more uh, we are amazed by how complex the brain is and how indefinable yet obvious intelligence is. And I feel the agriculture has taken roughly the same trajectory that enamored by the benefits of industrialization, we've tried to industrialize our entire food supply chain uh, at the far end of it in the dietary science, uh, we've tried to break down food into macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, and so on. And that's distinguished primarily by its lack of success in describing what is nutritious. And on the uh, production end of it, we've tried, to, um, we've tried to pick those strains of seeds, for example, uh, that, are, uh, that have a certain set of properties. And in doing so, we've lost the essential complexity and the wholeness that define nutrition. So industrialization failed in capturing intelligence and industrialization, I feel, uh, has failed in capturing uh, nutrition. So the, uh, my engineer's mind is, uh, is, is skeptical and uplifted by the fact that it's good to let nature take its own course and be available as stewards of nature rather than think of nature as a tool and attempt to control it in unnatural ways. Unfortunately, India also moved away from Gandhian vision for the nation and embraced the modern industrialization. It is not as if Gandhi did not know about the industrial world and given us a different vision, but he could clearly envision its adverse impact, especially in India, and he wanted us to lead our lives without exploiting others, but in support of each other in self-sustaining village communities. Here we see if Gandhiji's principles and vision can help us to correct the course of action in forming and our way of life. The idea about uh, growing a forest is basically you imitate what is happening in a forest, real forest. One word uh, that is missing from the vocabulary of no nature is there is nothing like wastage. It's, it's not just farming for the sake of farming, but farming for this purpose of understanding our role as stewards of creation and working with our hands and our feet, interacting with nature, with the animals around us, fostering life in places where there isn't life. Um, but it feels so wonderful to be a part of something here where we're always building soil, we're always adding back to the mother to the earth and giving back and we're being a part of this harmonious flow with nature always learning from her and with her and trying to to be supportive and so what we're doing is creating a sustainable form of gardening and and farming where there is a balance between what nature can provide and human needs We're busy, there are always things that need to be done. There are always you know, a million things going on around us and, and, and important things, but also we're, because we're constantly working with, with nature, with the animals, 
uh, like it says in the in Gandhi's principles, nature doesn't hurry, and so we just naturally we don't really hurry either. But we we get things done, and we we do what we can, and we let it go at the end of the day. Living simply on the land in harmony with nature, and and really just creating an example of an alternative way to live where we are able to live simply and provide for our basic needs. And we have found a great happiness in doing that. That we don't need to go out and get a lot of extra things, that we have everything that we need on the land uh, provided for us. What Fukuoka taught us and what Gandhi shared with us in this principle is that it's all nature's will in a much bigger way. That, in fact, there's a, a reality in nature that goes beyond just the name of that tree, that there's a spirit in that tree, that there is life in that tree. The uniting force that unites us with the universe is that which lies in nature, and it's just life itself. Really, one of the fundamental uh, questions that we're arriving at as people right now is is how are we supposed to be living on this planet on one hand we want to put ourselves on a pedestal of understanding and think that our technological prowess and our skyscrapers are the highest advancements in human culture in human history and yet what we see is that if that's coming at the expense of our planet we don't have a real means for making that claim that in fact um, the things that Gandhi presented us with, the principles for right living, for natural farming, mean far more than any kind of material accumulations or technological advancements that we think that we're making. And so when we start to really ask ourselves, how do we live here? It's good to have some guideposts. And it's certainly been the case for us that when we, when we need to ask ourselves, what's the right thing? What do we do next? We can come back to the guideposts of Gandhi's principles and think, is, is what I'm thinking right now, is this true to the idea that nothing from Mother, from Mother Earth is waste? Or that harmonious coexistence must be the essential basis upon which we're living? You know, these are fundamental things that if we can ask these questions and have the answer come back no, then we know we're not doing our best yet. We know we have a direction. And so as much as anything, I see these principles as holding up for us the direction that we know we should be moving in. Because it's not always going to be straightforward. Right now, what we need is bridge builders. We need people who can build a bridge from the modern world and what we value as people into the ideal world, that which Gandhi presented us and so many saints and sages have presented us with this ideal understanding of how to live on this planet. छत्तीस से तीस साल से ऑर्गेनिक फार्मिंग ही कर रहा हूँ मैं सबसे पहले जब स्कूल कॉलेज में था तो सेवाग्राम गया था गांधी जी की आत्मकथा पढ़ी बाद में विनोबा जी के पवनार आश्रम में भी जाते आते रहा और वो जो गांधी और विनोबा जी की संस्था से मुझे प्रत्यक्ष आचरण में उनके विचार कैसे लाए इसके लिए वो सीखने की बात है मेरे लिए मुख्य बात यह है कि हमारे कारण किसी का शोषण न हो चाहे व्यक्ति का हो या जमीन का हो तो एक शोषण मुक्त समाज व्यवस्था हमारा सपना है ना तो शोषण मुक्त व्यवस्था में तो ये आज अगर हम लोग चाहते हैं तो फिर हम क्या पाते हैं श्रम आधारित जीवन होना चाहिए और ये जो जैविक कृषि है श्रम आधारित श्रम आधारित है इसमें यंत्रों का अगर आपको उपयोगी करना है तो कम से कम का आप करेंगे 
और गांधी जी का जो मशहूर वाक्य है मदर अर्थ कैन सेटिस्फाई एवरीबडीज नीड बट नो बडीज नीड तो ये हमारी धरती माता को अगर हमें ठीक से रखना है तो हमें जहरीले रसायनों से तो मुक्ति पानी Gandhi ji moved to Sevagram ashram in Vardha to live within the village and to work directly with villagers sometime in mid 1930s the Sevagram literally means service village the ashram still has a school the farm goshala in its premises they also have khadi industry and stores selling their farm products clothes and books the farm practices sajeev kheti it is like natural farming it's integrated with cows and they meet their basic most of their basic needs and also they employ hum naam dev dhole hai मैं सेवाग्राम आश्रम की यहाँ खेती का व्यवस्थापन संभालता हूँ और गौशाला का भी संभालता हूँ यहाँ जो खेती है पूरा सौ एकड़ है यहाँ की खेती कुछ गांव वाले लोगों को लीज पर लगाई है एक साल का लीज होता है अच्छा और चालीस एकड़ खुद आश्रम करता है वो पूरा ऑर्गेनिक फार्मिंग है ओके इसमें कोई केमिकल नहीं है कोई फर्टिलाइजर का इस्तेमाल नहीं करते हम लोग अच्छा गांधी जी के टाइम से फार्मिंग चल रहा है तो अच्छा। उसी को हम वैसे ही करना चाहते हैं और कर भी रहे हैं अभी फिलहाल में अच्छा कैसे गांधी जी गांधी जी का कैसे प्रिंसिपल आप अप्लाई करते हैं प्रिंसिपल है ना उनका गाँव के लोगो को काम मिलना चाहिए अच्छा और रासायनिक खाद नहीं डालना चाहिए जो भी उनके प्रिंसिपल थे पुराने उस टाइम हम कर रहे हैं अच्छा खाद यही बनाते है यही का खाद यहाँ ही डालते है गौशाला है तो काफी खाद जमा होता है गोबर खाद वगैरह तो वो खेत में डाला करते हैं अच्छा और कीटकनाशक और बनाना है तो दस पद को अगर ये हम यही बनाते हैं तो यही अच्छा। का इस्तेमाल होता है अच्छा। बाजार से बहुत कम हम खरीद करते हैं अच्छा तो ऐसे चल रहा है हमारा वाला यहाँ पर अभी खेती में हमारे जवार है चूअर है मूंग मूंग होता है वो भी है मूंग है कपास कपास ने लगा इस साल फिलहाल में क्योंकि पिछले साल हमारा जरा कपास में वो गोंदड़ी करके है वो आई थी तो हमने हाँ बीटी ने लगाते हम लोग सादा कॉटन होता है लेकिन वो भी नो प्रॉफिट नो लॉस में चला जाता है उसका भी हम लगाते हैं लेकिन इस साल नहीं है हमारे पास गन्ना है शुगर केन वो भी है सोयाबीन का कुछ दस एकड़ का प्लॉट है ऐसा कुछ हमारे यहाँ होता है तो एकदम ऐसा कोई ज्यादा उत्पन्न नहीं होता नो प्रॉफिट नो लॉस में हमारी खेती चलती है अच्छा सस्टेनेबल तो आप सब उस इसी से इसी से हाँ हम यूज करते हैं यूज करते हैं लोगों का भी यहाँ गांव के लोगों को रोजगार मिलता है उनका भी पेट भरता है मिनिमम वेजेज एकदम ज्यादा नहीं है बाहर जैसे लेकिन उनका भी समाधान होता है गाँव की बाई लोग उनको भी काम मिलता है आश्रम की खेती में वगैरह काम करने का मौका मिलता है तो ऐसी खेती चल रही है हमारे यहाँ धन्यवाद थैंक यू
गौतम बजाज है मैं यहाँ पर वरदानी मेरे जन्म स्थान है यहीं से रहा हूँ विनोबा जी के साथ तीस साल तक रहने का मौका मिला विनोबा जी ने आश्रम में रहे बहुत तरह तरह के काम किए एक्सपेरिमेंट्स किए खादी वगैरह के काम किए इसके अलावा खेती में काम सफाई के काम मानना था कि खेती ही ये जीवन में सबसे महत्व की वस्तु है अगर आप देखें तो वेदों में उपनिषदों में खेती को ब्रह्मकर्म नाम दिया है तो ईश्वर के तरफ जाने के लिए जो सबसे नज़दीक का साधन है और जो निष्पाप जीवन के लिए सबसे श्रेष्ठ साधन है वो खेती है दूसरे जितने भी काम हैं उसमें कुछ न कुछ गलत चीज़ें आ जाती है लेकिन खेती जो है ये बहुत निष्पाप कर्म का है अब थोड़ी बहुत तो इसमें भी होता है गर्भ में लेकिन जितने भी हमारे यहाँ जो भी धंधे हैं उसमें ये सब होता है और क्या होता है कि अपने यहाँ पर पहले जीविका जीविका का साधन समझते हैं ना जीने के लिए जो हम कमाई करते हैं उसका साधन जीविका का साधन हम लोग कोई नौकरी करता है कोई कुछ करता है कोई कुछ करता है दुनिया भर में सबको मालूम हो गया है कि बिकॉज ऑफ दिस केमिकल्स हर्बिसाइड्स है पेस्टिसाइड्स है ये सब के कारण बहुत नुकसान होता है तो सब जानने लग गए हैं दिस इज नाउ साइंस ने कह भी दिया और लोगों में इसकी काफ़ी जागृति भी आ गई आज आज आस पास विलेजेस में थोड़ा चेंज हो रही आप केमिकल्स यूज में बहुत कुछ खास नहीं खास नहीं <laughs> खास कुछ नहीं अच्छा। हमारे यहाँ पर जो है हम इस्तेमाल करने नहीं तो क्या होता है कि आसपास के खेतों में जब फसल आती है पक्षी वहाँ जाते ही नहीं अच्छा यही आके पक्षी मर जा सारे पक्षी यहाँ आ जाते हैं तो हमारे तो बहुत खा जाते हैं हाँ। बंदर है वहाँ नहीं रहते हमारे यहाँ आ जाते अच्छा। हैं तो अब क्या करेंगे लेकिन हमारे लिए तो ऐसा है सृष्टि में जो है ईश्वर ने दिया है उनके लिए भी तो दिया है केवल हमारे लिए तो नहीं है तो हम मानते हैं कि ठीक है उनका भाग है वो थोड़ा बहुत वो ले लेते हैं कभी कभी जरा ज्यादा थोड़ा भी भी खड़ी कर देते हैं तो विनोबा जी का ऋषि केदी का कॉन्सेप्ट क्या है वो क्या का ये कॉन्सेप्ट है कि ऋषि जो करते थे ऐसा है बैल से वगैरह भी आप खेती करते हैं तो आपको उससे भी एक्सप्लोइट तो करते ही हैं और उसमें भी थोड़ी हिंसा आ जाती है लेकिन अपने शरीर श्रम से जब खेती करते हैं तो उसमें तो ज्यादा नहीं कर सकते जितनी ताकत होगी उतनी करेगी और जितना आपको खाने को चाहिए उतना ही पैदा होगा तो उसको आप स्टोरेज नहीं कर सकते संग्रह नहीं कर सकते हैं आज कॉमोडिटीज जो है फसल है गेहूँ है चावल है आप कितना स्टोर करेंगे लेकिन पैसा है हजार करोड़ आपने बैंक में रख दिया आप हजार करोड़ का गेहूँ रख सकता है क्या कोई कोई नहीं रख सकता अरे भाई ठीक है आपको एक क्विंटल लगता है एक टन लगता है आप दस टन रखोगे बीस टन रखो और क्या करोगे लाखों टन तो नहीं रख सकते इसलिए उसके कारण जो है जो संग्रह होता है और संग्रह के कारण एक्सप्लोइटेशन होता है एवरेज आधा घंटा सब लोग काम करते हैं तो हमारे यहाँ तो कोई एक घंटा भी करता है कोई दो घंटा करते हैं कोई नहीं कर सकते वो नहीं भी नहीं कर सकते हैं अच्छा कितने लोग हैं इधर यहाँ पर अभी पच्चीस कभी पच्चीस कभी तीस लोग रहते हैं तो हमारे जो वेजिटेबल्स हैं फ्रूट्स हैं ये सब हम यही करते हैं बाहर से नहीं लेते अच्छा And so we um, knew that we wanted to farm, but we did not have um, really a practical plan laid out for how we were going to do that. Um, but <clears throat> we were very open, and the opportunities came to us, including the opportunity to farm with Ananda here in Washington. So when we first came to Ananda to farm, um, we did not have a lot of experience farming. We had spent a couple of months together on a small organic farm, and that was really our first exposure to working with vegetables and working with plants. 
um, in a production sort of way. So it was a very new experience. Um, I got a college degree in philosophy and Zach studied finance and worked in finance for a couple of years. Um, but what we had more than anything was a love for nature and the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda, the universal yogic teachings that we knew would guide us. And we knew that even though we didn't know a lot of practical um, skills or didn't have a lot of practical knowledge about farming, we could apply these spiritual principles to it and good things would happen. And so that's really how we started the farm. We spent about a year just um, experimenting with the land, trying to tune into the land, trying to grow plants, and learning a lot as we went. Um, what we do now is we have uh, an integrated model where we have uh, interns that come. There's about six of us living full time on the farm. We do farmer's markets in the summer. We do three farmer's markets right now. So we um, take all of our produce and our different products um, to the market three times a week for about 20 weeks in the summer. And that's a great way for us to, um, one, get our product out there and share with people, but it's a really wonderful way to connect with the community and to meet our neighbors and to meet the people who are in the community who also resonate with uh, trying to live simply, trying to be connected to their source of food, and really just to be connected to each other on the land uh, provided for us. One of the feeling, one of the great blessings Haley and I had when we started farming was that we had no idea how to farm. And so we came into it with no notions of what was right and wrong mm -hmm. and with a total sense of awe because we came at it from a place of loving nature. Mm -hmm. And when you love nature, you realize nature is not just a physical thing, that it's mm -hmm. a super conscious thing, that there's spirit in nature mm -hmm. and that there's life there. And so, yeah, I think the single most important thing we can do is to keep the sense of awe that a child has, the way a child experiences nature. As soon as we lose that, then we become the experts and we become the doers. And as soon as we've reached that point, it might as well be over because we've killed the spirit. But as long as we can see it with fresh eyes, then we can be open to it being a miracle every day. You know, what's interesting is, is I'll go back to, to a quote by Bhaskar Save, which is the best fertilizer on the farm are the footsteps of the farmer. And for me, it's been that simple that when I can be present on the farm, just mm -hmm. with my own footsteps and in my own heart, just to walk the farm and tune in and feel it, then I know exactly what to give in a specific place it can be really abstract just to say oh just give to the farm mm -hmm. but when you spend time in in any single garden or with any single tree mm -hmm. then you know the exact right thing you know does this need mulch does this need alpaca poop does this need water you mm -hmm. know exactly what the needs are yeah. and you can just do what needs to be done so yeah that means uh, like really observing like and tuning into the trees and the nature and and really noticing I guess right I mean like what's happening I like to think about it as really being a friend I find things that other people don't value mm -hmm. and so we found that time and time again that you know like one of the Gandhian principles is that nothing from Mother Earth is waste mm -hmm. and we've I cannot tell you how much that has been our experience here that we can mm -hmm. find so many things that people don't want mm -hmm. and turn them into good soil or turn them into food for the animals it's mm -hmm. just it's incredible how much free resource there is that we can be uh, creating nice things with but I just want to show you guys how like in this row where you see all these formerly a living tomato plants mm -hmm. we will grow three or four crops in one row together Mm -hmm. and it's called companion planting mm -hmm. but here you see these tomato plants mm -hmm. and in the middle we have um, runner beans mm -hmm. on the edges we have kale and then even inside of there we still have some carrots right. and so yeah, I see those even plants. in the early spring too we filled the whole thing in with lettuce 
Dollars. And so that's five crops in one row mm. uh, for almost the whole growing season. And How do you choose like which one to which one? Or is yeah. the game just tuning into it? That's a great question. It is tuning into it, uh, but everybody has their purpose. And so like the pole beans, all mm -hmm. the all the bean family fixes nitrogen in the soil. Mm -hmm. So we try to plant those in every single garden bed to have a nitrogen fixer. Mm -hmm. The kale likes the shade of the tomatoes in the middle of the summer. Oh. And then a nice, and you think about it, it's like what's missing from the combination is a root, a root oh. crop. So the oh. carrots growing down, the tomatoes are growing up, the beans are fixing the nitrogen, the kale's in the shade. Mm -hmm. And so you have a leaf and you got fruits and you got a root and then it's a complete, <laughs> It's a complete body. It doesn't look like a bush to me. It looks like a healthy tree. But we put that in our nursery about three or four years ago and have found it's just grown extremely well. The other thing I'll point out is just as we look down here, this is very inconspicuous, but this is a little alder start. And so with almost every fruit tree and nut tree and berry that we've planted out here, we give them little sapling friends like this alder. And the alder is significant because it's one of the fastest growing trees in the Pacific Northwest and it fixes nitrogen in the soil. It's nature's regenerative tree. So if you watch where the alder grows, it grows in places that have been cleared and it regenerates the soil health by growing up in thickets and fixing nitrogen. And so fixing nitrogen means it's taking actual nitrogen out of the air and putting it back into the soil through its roots. It's what we do in the garden when we add manure. Only a plant has the consciousness to do that by itself that's amazing so for me that's these have been real awakenings to the idea that if we can tune into just like the animals what plants function what each plant's function is and we can partner them together mm -hmm. then we can create a system that it's not like we're creating it we're just we're it. facilitating it we're stewarding a system that's actually sustainable and and supports itself and so anyways, we can look over here and I'll just point them out like this is a molder, a mulberry, mm -hmm. also with a little alder. And that's an autumn olive, a nitrogen fixing shrub. And down there we have a willow growing right alongside a little, looks like a little plum whip. And as you kind of pan across the whole thing, it's willows and goji berries and josta berries and roses that are going to kind of form a thicket on the edge. And these will all be alpaca fodder. So we hopefully establish a lot of species the alpacas can eat also. And gradually maybe even phase out our fence and have a living fence. One of the greatest lessons, I call it having bee consciousness. And it is that you know, we have this way in our human minds of looking at nature and thinking that plants are good and bad. That this plant I planted here and I like, but this one over here is noxious and invasive. And so we have this way of discriminating and uh, of separating nature. But when you watch the bees, which is one of my favorite things to do from this bench right here, and you see them fan out over the farm, you realize they don't just say, oh, the lavender plants are good, that they go to the blackberries and they go to the thistles. And often the things that we call noxious and invasive, the bees find the most value in. And so for me, what I started to realize was they are collecting the nectar in every flower and they are finding the nectar in everything. And I think there's a deep lesson for all of us right now to just look for the nectar in life and not to find good or bad but just to know that everything has a purpose and there's nectar in everyone it has to be a real farm we have to make things that people want and we have to and for me that's where it just started getting expansive was the reality that you know we can it's about what we can offer our community what can we make that they need what what ways can we offer services to people and we see that in so many ways. It's kept us really diverse. And I think that's been the greatest harvest and eat and prepare the food together. And uh, it's just grown into a, a way of outreach where we can really provide a place for people to come to get grounded and connected right. with nature again. And so once people have that experience, then they want to support us because right. they can feel in themselves why this is important and why the world needs places where people are just choosing simplicity and and a relationship to nature again
And so that I think is the single num it's the number one thing actually oh, okay. is to help people feel it in themselves. But how that happens mm -hmm. can be spread across across a spectrum. And so uh, we make all of our own herbal basic needs. Right. And it started as just an idea that we could make all of our basic needs ourselves. But it quickly grew into once we learned how to do that, we need to share this with our friends and we need to share this with people who are also looking for basic needs alternatives that are made by real people and just with real ingredients. And so that supports us all year long. Whereas um, like the, at the farm side of it, you know, it has its season where we're selling things, we're selling produce. The herbal products we can sell all year and have an income stream to support the farm. In the summertime, uh, we do three farmers markets and we actually, you know, I guess you could say we do four markets and we do events at the farm. Uh, this year we have a lot more workshops on the schedule and we're gonna, and I think we really are moving in that direction of an education center. We realize we want to sell food, we want to get produce to people, but it's just as important that people can leave here with the inspiration to grow food themselves and to, and to support the local farmers that are growing the food. This is our fun it's intense little station. <laughs> <laughs> it's summer's very just being close to the earth and being able to um, be outside every day. I, I designed a calendar for three years now and I've worked with SketchUp um, drawing up plans for the new herb shop and the veranda that's already built. Oh nice. And there we have an online store that I help with shipping. Oh, and last summer, Peony and I did a children's camp here. At the farm? Mm-hmm. And we painted the goat shed. Hello, my name is Jacob Wolf McLeod, and I've been living on the farm here since this summer, uh, so just like six months maybe. Um, I've been visiting for years. I, uh, I grew up um, and, um, in the Midwest, so being on the farm has been absolutely wonderful. It's uh, one thing that, that did surprise me. I, I, like I said, I've been coming and visiting for years, and uh, we frequently take a little time off um, with Zach and Haley if, if I was up here. Um, but then living here, I thought, 
okay, it's, it's going to be real, we're going to be really busy. And I've come to find that we are, but it's a really beautiful, relaxed busyness. Um, it never feels anxious to me. There's, there's just isn't a sense of um, urgency or impending calamity, which I've experienced a lot of in other organizations where, um, where we're also very busy. But here, we're busy. There are always things that need to be done. There are always you know, a million things going on around us and, and, and important things. But also, we're, because we're constantly working with, with nature, with the animals, uh, like it says in the in Gandhi's principles, nature doesn't hurry, and so we just naturally we don't really hurry either. But we we get things done, and we we do what we can, and we let it go at the end of the day. Um, and it's been really wonderful to to get into that flow, and I'm still finding myself relaxing into it, and sometimes feeling like, oh, shouldn't I be feeling anxious about something? Shouldn't I? Isn't there something urgent happening? Uh, but there's not really. It, it's okay, even if sometimes oh the alpacas are out and they're eating all our kale. Well, okay, we've got more kale and we just herd them back in the pasture and close the gate and it's it's okay. Um, and uh, the the day to day is like that. Um, I've I've been uh, my background has been in building, so I've been engaged with a lot of little building projects on the farm so far and. Uh, it's been been really fun to bring that um, that ability here. Uh, I, there are a lot of a, a lot of projects that we we all see that will be very beneficial to have on the farm. Um, and I've been like refining the chicken coop and just kind of trying to make things easier, more convenient um, through my through the building lens. But I'm also doing a lot of agriculture. Uh, like planting, growing, harvesting things, um, and it, that's been a really wonderful balance to... It's, it's always easy to spend time with my hands in the soil and with plants and animals, um, but also still be uh, building and, and constructing and improving the farm. In the Hello, my name is Will Breckenridge, and I'm the Assistant Director of Living Wisdom School in Linwood, Washington. I've been working there for almost two years now. For the past year I've been coming up to the farm and, and volunteering and basically doing whatever needs to be done, whether it's moving wood chips and spreading them around trees so that they have um, enough moisture um, next summer, or um, bringing burlap sacks up from down in Everett and bringing them to the farm, um, planting, whatever needs to be done, I'm uh, happy to do it. and. Um, it's been a very inspiring experience because I am what Zach calls a city boy. You know, I had no knowledge of gardening, no knowledge of, of farming and permaculture and natural farming. Those were things that are all new to me and they still are. Um, so it's been a, a learning process. What we're doing is creating a sustainable form of gardening and, and farming where there is a balance between what nature can provide and human needs. So we're not taking more than what we're giving. In fact, we give a lot more. And because of that, there's plenty. Um, also, I would say becoming a, a vegetarian. Uh, that wasn't something I, I was before. Um, you know, I was just like, had my meat and potatoes and maybe a few other veggies. But it was always very much a kind of a car carnivore diet. But since moving here, I think it's the fact that I interact with so many animals, feeding the chickens, you know, um, seeing goats, you know, milking the goats, those kind of experiences have learned or have taught me to appreciate life for more than, um, than just food. If I had to say one of my like top 10 life experiences, um, it would actually be digging holes here at Ananda Farm. And that sounds so bizarre. What could be so fun about digging holes? It's definitely laborious. It requires a lot of effort and you're definitely sore at the very end of it. But um, what was inspiring for me was just the thought that, again, we're fostering life. We've planted fruit trees and nut trees and shrubs, and these trees are going to be here long after I've died. And um, that's an inspiring thought, just plant, literally planting seeds for the future. And so one afternoon, Zach and I um, were just were digging holes 
and we were having a great conversation just talking about each other's lives and talking about the future of the farm and it was very inspiring and we were looking at it like okay I think we've got about like 32 33 holes and like should we make it to 40 and I'm like yeah let's do it let's do it even 40 holes and so hey little dog um, and so uh, we said okay we're gonna do 40 holes and we finished we're like okay let's go get some food and later Zach told me he said hey Will uh, you won't guess how many plants how many trees I have I'm like how many 40 trees so we dug 40 holes for 40 trees that are just out there in the field and um, in some small way I think we were attuned to that like okay this is what needs to be done 40 holes and 40 trees but it the time passed so quickly I felt more inspired and more energetic than if I stayed home and watched Netflix honestly so the CSA the community supported agriculture the weekly boxes are really what got the farm started um, the CSA existed for three or four years in the community um, before we got the farm and so that starting of growing food really got the momentum together for people to be interested in expanding that operation which led us to the farm and it's also what helped sustain the farm in the first few years um, of its existence we took on the csa and were able to expand it um, in the sense that we were able to serve more members um, partially from the community and then eventually we expanded it onto the island into our local community so where it started um, with maybe 20 members at a certain point we had uh, over 50 members um, between two locations that were served by the CSA and again it's really what helped get the farm off the ground it was um, a commitment that was made it was uh, income that came to the farm it was energy that um, really guided us forward and led us into what we have now even in acquiring land or having somewhere to garden and farm it came through being a part of a community in a way that I think it's a it's an amazing model that can be replicated anywhere which is that when you have a bunch of like-minded people who share a vision you can accomplish a lot more a lot faster than trying to do it all by yourself and right. so that was certainly part of our experience was that because we had so many people who were invested in this idea when we found land we could buy the land and because we all believed in it people weren't buying it with the idea of wanting a fiscal return they were they were investing in it as an idea that we can create something for a generation beyond us we can create something sustainable hi my name is samara i'm a yoga instructor and work at the institute of living yoga so with the um, ananda farm csa in the past it was um, we pre prepaid all at, at the beginning each time a box arrived it would be like a treasure of amazing things that i had no idea i would get to enjoy um, so it was just made it kind of just like a fun exploration of all these things that i never would have experienced before all kinds it was like squashes peas Chronomix, greens, tomatoes, lavender, mint, fruit, apples, pears, pear apples, cherries, everything. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, did you find any challenges with that concept, either with the delivery or did you have any uh, uh, issues, either with the delivery or with the produce or with the quality at any time? Um, with the quality and the delivery, no. The only issues that I had was just like not having enough time to cook, um, working full time and stuff like that. So it's never, it was never an issue with the food or the farm. Hi there, my name is Padma McGilloway and I live at the Ananda community in Linwood, Washington. And it's part of Ananda, Washington overall which includes the Ananda Farm. Well, it's amazing. I mean, there's produce, there's also eggs, because we have chickens, and the chickens are fed all organic materials, and if you open the chicken egg from the farm, the, the yolk is like a deep orange, you know? And when you open the chicken egg from the store, the yolk is like a light yellow. I mean, it's... <laughs> huge difference um, 
for the other items, you know, they're just greener and um, they have more life force in them somehow than they do with uh, the store-bought items. To me, the most important aspect of a most relevant aspect of a community farm is the fact that it's based locally. That, um, that we as consumers of food have a very good idea of where it came from. Uh, and I'm not here so much uh, pushing an ideology such as uh, GMO is good or GMO is bad or things like that. I'm, my own, per I have opinions on it, but uh, that's not where I'm going with it. That if we know where it comes from, if we can directly check uh, who grew it and what methods they used, then we can support it and consume it based on what our own beliefs about our food ecosystem are. And that to me is, is, is very important. We insist on that kind of a knowledge in other aspects of our lives, uh, but very stunningly in the, in, in the post-industrialized world, uh, we no longer insist on that uh, in terms of food. It is, it is perfectly okay somehow to consume food that has been uh, uh, divested of all of its, uh, its, its natural vibration and reconstitute it back using some industrialized methods. And we don't question it, the one hand. And second, there is really no good alternative, especially in the United States. You are, uh, for the most part, stuck to eating this kind of anonymous, industrialized, reconstituted food of unknown pedigree. So my interest in community farming stems primarily uh, from the deep-seated belief that we do need to know that we need to take a better ownership of what it is that we put into our mouths and what it is that we use to sustain ourselves. My name is Naya Swami Raymond McGillaway. I live in the Seattle, Washington area of the United States. I have been involved with intentional communities for some 40 years. I'm part of a network of communities, intentional communities worldwide, about eight of them, five of which are on the west coast of the United States, California, Oregon, and Washington, uh, one in India, one in, in Italy, Europe, and two in Oregon, so eight altogether. A big part of our communities, the first of which was established in 1976 in Northern California by Swami Kriyananda, has always been the growing of food. The Ananda Network of Communities was inspired by Paramahansa Yogananda, who came from India in 1920 to take up residence in the United States. During the 1930s depression and until his passing in 1952, he often urged audiences, and he was a well sought after speaker throughout the United States. Thousands of people would come to his lectures. Sometimes he had to give the same lecture twice to accommodate everyone who wanted to hear him. But he urged people in those times to buy land with other people and to grow their own food. It's as if he saw into the future the complexity of modern agricultural business methods and our losing touch with the land, with the soil, with air and water, and with friendships with one another. In Seattle, or north of Seattle, we have a five and a half acre community that was established in 1972, and we have always been growing food on our, our property. But some years ago, perhaps 2010, approximately, uh, some of our members, residents of that community, began growing food in a CSA, a community supported um, agricultural organization. And what we did is members and friends locally here in Seattle would prepay the harvest for the year in about February of every year, three or $400 per, per box. 
and for about 12 to 14 weeks in the summer, uh, we would reap the harvest of the, of the weekly harvest of the plots. Around 2012, I'd say, our founder, Swami Kriyananda, who has only had about a year of life remaining, began to travel and urge the communities to step up our efforts to growing food. And accordingly, we purchased about 15 acres, about an hour north of Seattle, on the island of Kameno Island. And there began a far more extensive um, growing of food, making of products from the food and from the land, and creating uh, a place to live. So our inspiration is, could be said to be an extension of Gandhi's inspiration to um, encourage the inhabitants of planet Earth to get back in touch with Earth, to be more self-sustaining in, in the crafts and clothes and in our relationship to the Earth in general. And so Yogananda, who uh, met Gandhi back in 1935 and who uh, had a close relationship with him, it was very much part of the Gandhian ideals of sustainable living. The significance of the farm goes far beyond food. Food is important, having uh, a relationship with the land and the environment is important, but there's a deeper element to it, which is friendships, with, which are the relationships between people working together in a common ideal, an ideal that um, goes beyond just one's own needs, goes beyond profits or making money or any other such um, motives, but has to do with a harmonious relationship with one another, with the earth, and ultimately with a higher power. And so our interest in, in growing food goes beyond ecology, goes beyond even sustainability from a material purpose, but also includes how we live and the values we hold to be important. Respect for one another. We have a uh, saying that people are more important than things. And what that means to us is that the best interest, the highest good for one another will take precedence even over the material needs or profits if, if that's an issue. Now, when we purchased the 15 acres on Kameno Island, we gathered together our members and set out our ideals. We wanted to buy land. We wanted as much as possible not to have any debt on that land, to raise the cash, so that the investment would be more of a land bank. It would not be a rate of return. It was not to reap a financial benefit. It took place in, at a, such a time when uh, people were concerned about financial return and interested in, in having a land bank, as I call it. And we agreed with one another that if a person needed to liquidate their investment for their health or other reasons, that we would find other friends and members to replace those funds. Over time, we expect that the property will be improved, it has been improved, and we expect that the land bank will hold its value relative to the purchasing power of our local currency, the, the American dollar, such that the rate of return would be reflected whenever one needed to sell one shares to another member by virtue of the value of the underlying property. The control of the farm is done through an organization which in America, perhaps other countries too, is a kind of partnership. We call it, or the law calls it, a limited liability company, but essentially it's a partnership. And the partnership has um, managers who make the basic decisions, the members of which we have about 20 members who have invested anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000 uh, and the total farm cost was about $450,000. Our 20 members don't make basic day-to-day -day decisions. There's a legal reason for that to protect them from possible debts and so forth, 
But there's a more practical reason, which is let the farmers make the decisions. And we all agreed that that, that made sense and so forth. So we have four managers elected by the members and the members only make important decisions like should we sell the farm or should we borrow a substantial amount of money. Only the key important decisions do the members make. The most important decision they make is to elect the managers. Yes, harmony in decision making is a key aspect of what our intentional communities have learned with the guidance of our founder many years ago. There are several aspects that make it possible for us to make those decisions and we've never had any controversy. One, in our case, with only 20 members, we know all of each other. We, we share the ideals that I mentioned earlier and that's very, very important. Another thing is that among those ideals that we share, we ask ourselves, what's trying to happen? Not what do I think, what's my opinion, what do I want, what do I like, what do I don't like, or who I like and who I don't like, but what's, what's the sense of what's needed in this situation? The fact that in our case, everyone does know each other, does limit the amount of controversy, but of course we all have our own opinions and so forth. And so I come to the second part that's essential, and it's called leadership. I emphasize this for one important reason. In the history, the modern history of intentional communities, there is a strong bias away from too strong leadership. That bias reflects the democratic principles of intentional communities, and it, and, and it is a good thing. But the bias in fi, uh, against and in fear of too strong a leader um, can undermine the decision-making process to where it has to be a consensus and where everybody has to agree. Well, that's pretty impossible, the larger the group gets, and what that does is simply paralyze the ability of the organization or the group of people to make any forward progress because everyone has to agree. And so in the cultivation of leadership in the 50-year history of the Ananda communities, we've recognized that inspired, supportive, sensitive leadership is essential in order to guide a group of people to the highest and best for everybody. And so, you know, our group, our people are sensitive and respectful of the need to recognize in this person or that person um, their ability to have a vision, if you will, and the ability to see what's needed for everybody or for the good of the project and so forth. And so our group does respect leadership as a role, not more important than other roles, including the important role of farming and getting the work done, but certainly as something that can help coalesce um, the project in a positive direction. We were accustomed to the fact that in Ananda's history of communities, organic farming still employed monoculture farming, still employed row crop farming, still had tractors and irrigation and that kind of thing. And many of our farms in our other communities still do. But when our managers, our farmers, really wanted to move in that newer, unaccustomed direction, there were, there were doubts and there were um, there were never any arguments, but there was definitely a lot of discussion about, gee, do we really need a tractor, and so on and so forth. So I would say the challenges we had was to set the direction of our style of farming in a new way, uh, a more, um, pardon the term, a more organic way. Interestingly enough, we've not been interested in having our farm certified organic. There are controversies around that that are best left to others to describe, but we've never felt the need for organic certification, though we are certainly organic. Our own story uh, and so forth, high ideals, cooperation, um, 
supportive leadership, et cetera, giving, we gave our farmers, as indicated in my prior comments just a moment ago, wide latitude to experiment. But there was one thing I didn't mention that we did say was what we expected of them. We said, here's the land, here's some working capital, we want you to pay the bills and your goal, so far as financial um, issues are concerned, are to break even. We do not want you to come back to the owners and say we need more money, more money, and more mo money. Because part of giving them the scope to experiment with farming styles uh, had the unspoken danger that it might not pay for itself. And uh, fortunately, our farmers live on subsistence wages, very modest a stipend and so forth, and they work very hard uh, and very creatively. But that was the one thing we, we required of them, is that for them to pay their own way, they didn't have to make a lot of profit. We do not give our owners dividends. They do not receive the harvest. They have to pay for the harvest like everyone else. Um, they have an ownership in a land bank, as I said at the very beginning. And so those were the parameters we, we use, and it's never been a challenge. Their, their um, activities there are so creative and, and so uh, magnetic that they've always been able to pay the property taxes, to pay the insurance, all the kinds of things that a, that a partnership, a business, has to uh, deal with apart from the direct cost of farming, and they've done a, a beautiful job at it. What surprised me is, is just blown away by how bountiful the land was. It was, it was just incredible during harvest time. Uh, it just, it, it, it takes, it takes a lot of physical effort just to pick the ripe apples that are waiting to be picked. And it's, uh, yeah, we, we, I was like any other a reasonably educated person. I was aware of this from a theoretical perspective, but it's something else to go out there and see how incredibly bountiful it is. And the other part that surprised me was um, in the state of Washington, which is where I live, uh, it's known for its apples. And they, they come from a specific part of Washington. And there's about two or three varieties of apples. Here. They, and these apples, you know, uh, these apples look very nice, and I used to think that they tasted very nice, uh, in the sense that they, they have a nice sweet taste and they have a crispy consistency, and so on. Now, what Zach and Haley have done in the farm is uh, the the species of apple that is local to here is quite different from what the industrialized agriculture of the state of Washington produces. And it's, uh, it, it's a species that's very, very local to, um, uh, to the islands. And uh, homesteaders in this area have had these apple trees for about 150 years. And you can still find them. And that's the uh, uh, species of apples that is, uh, is being grown in our farm. And when I tasted it, the taste for, was far more complex. It was, it was, it fed, um, there was, um, uh, there was sweetness to it, but there was uh, tartness uh, to it as well, perhaps even a little bit of astringency. Uh, it was so different from the almost choreographed, uh, made-up kind of apple which looked the part, uh, but in, the, in doing so lost most of its complex uh, qualities of taste. Uh, and this this totally surprised me. I had not expected it. Here, here is proof that uh, local agriculture uh, produces food that is more palatable and more tasty, but not in the one-dimensional sense that we are used to. It may not look as good. In fact, some of these apples uh, look ugly, and I enclose that thing in quotes because we are, we are used to, at least in the last 30, 40 years, especially in the US, used to food looking a certain way. Uh, it's almost as if they have to play a part uh, in our lives. Whereas these, look what they look. That's, that's what came out of the earth. The taste is 
complex. The taste is very fulfilling and satisfying in a way that's hard to capture. You have to taste it to feel it. The challenges have been the government. <laughs> And uh, how you know, so? <laughs> well, I mean, they're trying to get, for instance, right now, permits to be able to sell their products more publicly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, beyond just locally, and that requires a lot of red tape. Mm -hmm. um, the challenges, I wouldn't call it a challenge, but when we first got the farm, they needed, the farmers needed some time to just be there mm -hmm. and feel what areas would be used in which ways. It's not like a mental process. It was more of an intuitive process and that took time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, they were able to keep that in balance with making products and doing things that would generate income. Recently, I thought of actually doing the farming in a different way, uh, thanks to climate change. I find it very difficult to do the regular way of farming, like tilling the land, sowing the seeds, uh, uh, cultivating them, and then harvesting, and then trying to sell that produce of after meeting our demands, internal demands. And then again, the cycle starts. You have to till it again. You have to do the lot, lot many things you don't want to do. But uh, the name of the game is to do better all the time, to produce more. And uh, to, to that extent, uh, we all know that we are burdening the earth, mother earth, particularly in terms of soil, soil fertility. So now, because of climate change uh, effects, mm -hmm. we find that the season-specific crops, which are season-sensitive and season-dependent crops, are not doing so well because of change in the climate. Change in the climate means change in the seasons. But because of the variation in sunlight, the heat, the humidity, the winds and uh, some other internal factor which we are not really aware of but we we know this much that unless the season synchronizes with the the growth uh, pattern of any given crop you can't get any optimum yield so we always find that 
particularly during the last one decade that the yields are coming down and uh, sometimes we lose the entire crop because of the season synchronization is not happening. So as an alternative, as a solution to this problem, I find that we have to create a new concept known as fruit forest. So till now we know about fruit gardens, but uh, this is slightly different uh, from that concept wherein you actually grow a forest. In a forest you have diverse uh, species of uh, trees and plants, but whereas we, have, we are more focused on growing fruit trees in forest fashion. That's the only difference. The idea about uh, growing a forest is basically you imitate what is happening in a forest, real forest. One word uh, that is missing from the vocabulary of no nature is there is nothing like wastage in nature. Yes. Particularly in forest, there is no wastage. Yes. In economic terms, you may think because of your uh, education, because of your uh, mm, you know, understanding of uh, this business, economics and all that, you may think that uh, a tree produces some surplus uh, fruits which if you are unable to market them, you consider that to be a wastage in economic terms. But in nature's terms, it's not a wastage. All that is produced is going to fall on earth, the soil, the soil will digest that and in turn the soil becomes more fertile. Yes. That's how we have reached to this stage. Prior to agriculture, uh, industrial uh, revolution, the earth was actually, the soil fertility of the entire earth was actually increasing all the time. Why? Because they never considered any surplus produced by any tree as a wastage. Yes. They did not try to take advantage of that uh, in terms of uh, money, or wealth or whatever. So, essentially we have to produce food and uh, cotton. The, the, they are the two most essential things. And when it comes to food, uh, the, the food, the kind of food that we are eating these days uh, consists of uh, cereals, pulses and all that and uh, some of it is meat also. But uh, if you consider the fruit aspect as a food, there are certain advantages which uh, the, uh, the mainstream uh, food cannot give. One ad main advantage is uh, easily digestible, means you get ready energy and uh, you have no side effects as long as uh, you take only fruits and uh, their byproducts. And uh, another advantage is uh, you, you tend to actually pick up, you don't do any agriculture as such. It's a kind of permanent agriculture mm -hmm. where you let the tree grow and after some time it will continue to give you fruits. So they let the, only, the nature yeah, work. Yeah, let the nature uh, take its own uh, uh, course. Okay. And uh, eventually, because of our uh, you know ability to plan, design a system, we take advantage of that uh, positivity about nature. That's all. And we we can always meet our uh, food needs. Okay. And another more important thing is, as you take more and more fruits as your main diet, mm -hmm. main food item, you tend to actually take less and less you are going to put a, uh, a burden far lesser than what you are actually putting in the name of regular agriculture. That is growing crops which are annual in nature. That mm -hmm. means you have to go on doing it again and again. And uh, another important thing is whenever you talk about agriculture, the entire industrial spectrum will get into the picture. Right. Now you you cannot even think of doing agriculture, cultivating a crop without the help of industrialized society. Okay. Be it machines, be it uh, chemical fertilizers, be it uh, anything that comes out of a 
industry. So this is leading more to self-reliant and yeah. self-sustaining yes. Uh, yes. farms. Yes. And uh, my ultimate uh, idea or goal is to, is to, if we grow them as we plan to, in near future, uh, one should be able to quench his taste buds, quench his uh, hunger by eating the fruits of the season yes. and any, on any given day. Right. So that's my ultimate goal. Sustainability is like such a big topic these days and I just like, like truly sustainable agriculture has to be integrated with trees because that's like what's actually sustainable on the planet. Mm. You know, the whole vegetable cultivation, that's fine on its own scale, but we're really talking about feeding ourselves sustainably. Trees are the way. They mm -hmm. support the planet and, they, and it's like nuts and fruit. Uh -huh. There's so many directions we could be cultivating to provide all of our basic needs through those two things, nuts and fruit. It's like, oh, it's just the future. It's a longer rhythm yeah. of working with nature. And it is, they're actually sustainable. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in the old days, farmers used to have big families. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the modern version of that is community. Community. You do need community, but you don't need the large Ananda community. That's, you know, way bigger than you need to start mm -hmm. a farm like we have on 15 acres. Mm -hmm. But you need community. You need um, a couple of families, um, mm -hmm. you know, One or two. five or six or eight or adults who come together you need a few people to pool together to pool their resources and then work together our tendency when we clear things to build is not just to log it but what we found here when we got here was that it had been logged and scraped and so all the organic material had also been scraped into piles and burned and so when we got here even though we're surrounded by forest it was debt back down to the sand level and there was very little topsoil anywhere um, but we weren't discouraged just with the understanding that you can make good soil everywhere mm -hmm. and i think that's also not a conventional attitude right now we think we have to have the river loam soil to grow things and that certainly helps but i think mm -hmm. we also need to know that we can make good soil anywhere right. so uh, that was you know where we started in the leaf garden was just our philosophy just if we can feed the soil we just have to have the attitude of giving back to the soil. The intelligence of the soil life will manage the fertility, will manage the water for us. Mm -hmm. And so like that garden, for example, we almost barely ever have to water. It's completely unirrigated, but we will water things in the middle of the summer. Oh. But because there's so much humus now. And I think that's a really important point to make is that uh, we can live sustainably and farm regeneratively but the scale that we're doing it has to shift. And it means more of us having more of a connection to a little piece of earth. Mm -hmm. And when each of us has a connection to a piece of earth and really stewards it in that way, there's no reason we can't grow our food and have rich, abundant life in the soil and everywhere. But, you know, as long as we're, our relationship is contingent on a few farmers growing all the food for everyone, mm -hmm. it's, no mis it's not a coincidence that things are playing out like they are on a global scale. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, for me, that's really hopeful because it just means it's an individual choice for us to make mm -hmm. that we can choose as individuals and as communities. And from that little starting point, we can grow and just choose to do the right thing. And the solution is already ready. It's just a matter of choosing it. <laughs> there, are, there are exciting things happening at the farm just with more people being here. We have our first kind of resident builder that we've ever had. Jacob is here now and he really has a passion and the, and the, and the knowledge to build things really